Welcome to VO Life, brought to you by Gravy for the Brain Oceania. My name is Toby Ricketts, and today we've got a very special guest on the podcast. As you know, we like to invite people who are movers and shakers in the industry, uh, see what's going on, see who people have got new ideas and new products in this case. And I'm uh, proud to introduce Adam Fritz, who's CEO of Positron, uh, which is an audio uh, narration tool uh, that, that audio narrators can use to increase their workflow. Um, in fact, why am I trying to introduce your product? Hello, Adam. Do you want to give us a little overview on um, on what the vision is for Positron? Of course. Hi, Toby. Um, so Positron's been around since we launched in 2017, uh, at least started development in 2017, um, really with the goal of making audio, human-voiced audio production easier, faster, and more efficient. Um, our founder, Jake Posnansky, uh he was an avid audiobook listener and was playing around with ASR, which stands for Automated Speech Recognition Technologies, um, and really kind of fell backwards almost across the audiobook workflow. Um, there's a lot of people who are really, really good at their jobs, but there's a lot of very manual steps involved in the process, as I'm assuming most of the listeners will know. Um, so what our tool is designed to do, just like it's easier to type a book using Microsoft Word and something like Grammarly, our tool is designed to make it just as easy to produce an audiobook. So we still keep the human part of the audiobook production process. Um, you know, human voiced audio is in by in my in my opinion, uh, in all measures, uh, superior to AI voiced audio. Um, but really, what our tool does is gives the same advantages uh, to human voiced uh, audiobooks in terms of speed, efficiency, and accuracy um, that uh, the synthetic audio companies claim. Um, so really, our tool is just designed to make it easier for you to produce uh, any sort of human voiced audio project uh, recorded from a script. Mm, fantastic. And how long has it been around? Because I feel like Positron was the first time I really heard um, AI or machine learning being used in the same sentence as, uh, as, as audiobooks and, and voiceover. So we were founded in 2017. Our first, We launched commercially in December of 2018, and we've grown leaps and bounds uh, since then. I've been with the company since January of 2021, and we've grown just in that time. We've grown about seven times in three mm. years. So um, we're, we're growing rapidly. Um, we had probably about a, just over a third of audiobooks produced in the U.S., uh, last year went through Positron, or this year I should say, 2023 went through Positron uh, by our by our count, um, and it's it's growing growing significantly. Um, so yeah, the company we're we're constantly developing new features, either based on our roadmap or based on what uh, what customers have requested. So um, if you're a customer and you have questions or or want to suggest something new, please reach out to us. Hello at Positron.com. Nice. Um, that's. Uh... I, I didn't realize that it uh, had such market penetration there. That's, uh, that's a real feather in your cap that so many uh, audiobook um, companies have sort of taken this on board. Um, from the brief Thank demo you. I had, um, it did seem like um, so many of the problems had kind of been solved. I do, actually want to preface this because it's been bugging me as well. I know this sounds, <laughs> it sounds a little bit like an infomercial, like I have been paid to say these things, but um, I, I, I had a demo to this Positron because I'm always interested in finding new tools um, that make uh, voiceover life easier, of course, why wouldn't I? Um, and, and this demo really shocked me because I was just like, gosh, this is, this is like, there are so many useful things in here. This is all the stuff that you would want as a voiceover artist. And I wanted to get in touch um, with Positron um, to talk about this because I find it fascinating and I just want to make it clear that I have, I have received zero dollars <laughs> for this endorsement um, but I like new technology and especially as it relates to voiceover so um, yeah amazing market penetration into the market um, you have um, a lot of more a lot of companies are doing this now but you have a distributed workforce you have sort of different people all around the world not really one central office with everyone in cubicles um, and and quite a big part of this workforce is in Ukraine is that right Correct, and, yes. And we all know what's happened um, in Ukraine over the time that Positron has been developing. Do you want to take us through sort of the how that, like why Ukraine and then how it affected your business when, of course, uh, Russia invaded uh, those years ago? Of, of course, yeah. So um, we've got 15 people on our team um, and 10 of them are located in, or I should say nine, 10 of them are Ukrainian. One of them is um, in <clears throat> Poland now. Um, and that happened because our founder, his wife was Ukrainian. And so she had a, you know, it helped connect a network of kind of early stage developers in Ukraine. And it just grew organically from there. Um, <clears throat> so our team is located in four or five different cities in Ukraine, Lviv, Kiev, my 
as my Ukrainian team would say, my pronunciation is probably not perfect. Um, Lviv, Kiev, Kharkiv, Dnipro, and I'm forgetting one city. Um, and really, once the war started, as you can imagine, there was a shock for all of our Ukrainian uh, teammate colleagues, um, as well as us in North America, just watching helplessly. Um, so it had a huge effect on our team. We basically shut down uh, development for about two months uh, and paid full salaries, full benefits. You know, their priority was not work um, and left it up to them to come back to work at whatever pace they wanted. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in family first um, and that w- we work to live, we don't live to work. Um, So it's very important that our team works hard and delivers value for our customers, but you know, we don't exist just to work for Positron. We exist to have family and friends and and, and a, and a life Um, and working hard at Positron gives us the money to do that. So um, they took their time and within two to within two months, um, people started coming back, uh, you know, in drips and drabs is the wrong way to put it, but at their own pace. And within three to four months, even with the war going on, we were back to full capacity um, for a couple of reasons. One, the power outages and all the disruptions were um, stable, stabilizing a little bit. Um, and I think, quite frankly, our team really needed um, an element of normalcy in their life, even though, you know, some of the, I distinctly remember having a call with one of our um, development team members and he got really distracted for, and was looking off screen like this repeatedly. I said, are you know, do you, are you okay? Do you need to go? And he said, I'll be right back. And he went to the window, said, oh, sorry. My, and he came back and he said, the building was shaking, but don't worry. It's just the anti-aircraft battery down the street. Um, wow. Wow. It's, uh, wow. you know, they sent pictures of tanks. They went to the grocery store and tanks rolling down the street. So, um, it's certainly for me living in Vancouver, Canada and, you know, uh, first world luxury um, really puts a lot in context, uh, put mm. a lot in context for me. Um, but then also as as a company, it really made us get hyper focused, even more hyper focused, I should say, on um, an employee is at his best or her best um, when he or she feels supported by the company um, in, you know, whatever struggles they're going through, be that in a war zone or going through depression or whatever that is. So from a, a career um, perspective for me, it really, again, reinforced how essential it is for a company and a manager to support um, the person, not just the employee. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And good on you for that. That's, uh, that's good to hear. And good for, the, like you say, for them to continue some normalcy and have some income and, and still be able to, you know, do do what they uh, do, what they do, despite the uh, the awful conditions that have been, um, exactly. you know, put onto them. Um, so, mm-hmm. The, the the software itself it's um it's really good to hear a company that has um that, that was kind of um an early adopter with machine learning as it relates to the voice and it's very comforting to hear that you are firmly on the side of humans narrating and you haven't sort of been tempted to say wow we've got all these publishing companies we could just sell them an AI voice product and you know and make lots more sales um that was obviously a conscious decision at some point when you saw what could happen or what uh, what so do you want to tell us around the the decisions uh, that led to to that being human first for sure. I mean, I can't speak exactly to what happened back in 2017 because I wasn't with the company then, but I will say um, there were a ton of different companies out there trying to create synthetic audio. So there was an, there was two, I think, two things, major things in play. One, um, our founders' belief that a, that human voice audio was um, uh, superior, uh, number one. Number two, there was a uh, pragmatic approach to no companies doing what we're doing, infinity companies doing uh, synthetic narration. So there was a pragmatic approach to that. But I think in real reality, our, our team, one of the only prerequisites for for getting hired by Positron um, is actually listening to audiobooks and being an audiobook fan, because um, we as a company believe that audiobooks are an art form. Um, I can say being a, uh, a parent of two young boys, um, they are absolutely glued to every minute of an audiobook that they listen to. Um, it's one of the only times they actually will be quiet. Um, so I really identify with the transformative impact that a, a human, a really well-told story can have. Um, mm-hmm. And so as a company, we really believe that that human voiced audio is superior and um, can be improved by giving being given the right production tools. Um, and so, you know, if you look at all of these synthetic audio companies out there, they are going to continue to get better and better. And 
the pragmatist in me understands that there will be more and more of the market taken by synthetic audio. Um, but if you, if you as a human voice create a human, a creator of human voiced audio, um, if you continue to get better at your job, whether that's being more efficient or, you know, your acting improves or, or whatever that is, you're going to stay ahead of these um, synthetic voices. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. And as a quick aside, because, you know, like you say, uh, your audiobooks are one of your favorite art forms. Me too. I, I very rarely pick up a book and read it now. I always try and find the audiobook version because I find mm -hmm. my time is spent so much more efficiently where I can be driving, yeah. I can be doing the gardening, and I'm like listening. Yeah. And I feel like I listen better to an audiobook than when I read because my mind wanders yeah. when I read. Yeah, um, sure. And do you have a, like a top three um, <laughs> audiobooks that Ooh, like your I your do. Um, so... I generally listen to nonfiction audio and mm. read fiction as a general rule. I do most of my reading before bed and I just like to sit there and read a book. Um, my three favorite audiobooks, um, in no particular order, The Bomber Mafia by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, so good. Um, so good. So really good. And I really loved what Pushkin is doing in terms of um, it's not just Malcolm Gladwell reading any snippet yeah. of, of a um Enhanced an interview books, with they call it exactly yeah. yeah yeah and so you actually instead of just hearing Malcolm Gladwell read the text of what the interview e said mm. um, you actually hear the voice of the person who was being interviewed and it was really 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 well done mm. um, second one would be. Um, Project Hail Mary, narrated by Ray Porter. We've got uh, literally is, like the same top three. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Really, really good. And yeah. um, I'm a my dad has instilled in me an absolute love of uh, the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit series. Mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. the Andy Circus narrated uh, Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings and Hobbit are all really, really incredible. Uh, yeah. Very long listens, yeah. uh, but really, yeah. really incredible. Really yeah, Andy Circus is amazing on that. I've seen clips of him. I've never listened to the audiobooks myself, but I've, I've, I've seen clips of him performing it in the studio. And he just does have one of those amazing voices, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, and, and also just the fact that he played one of the characters in the movies. There's so yeah. much crossover um, when he yeah. voices Gollum in the books. It's, yeah, yeah really, really exactly. Um, I had the good pleasure of meeting up with um, Simon Vance and Ray Porter when I was in Hollywood because they've been on the podcast wow. um, recently. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, such such great narrators in their own right. And, uh, and they really do yeah. make the, the audiobooks, you know, really spring off the page, especially like you say, Ray Porter's performance in, uh, in Project Hail Mary. If anyone out there hasn't listened to it, just go and get it and listen, because it's one of the best books and the best performances of a book like I've ever heard. It's yeah. so compelling. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and also honorable yeah. mention to, um, to Derek Perkins, who read Yuval Noah Harari's um, Sapiens and Homo okay. Deus. So put those yeah. on your list if you haven't, because he, he totally informed my my kind of like nonfiction delivery. Um, I will have reads. to because I actually couldn't get through Sapiens. <laughs> I started oh, really? just by re just reading yeah. it. I mean, so yeah. for me, I read mostly before bed. Anything mm. that's too dense nonfiction, it puts me to sleep too fast. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so nothing against that He's an amazing author, but it just, yeah. so I'm going to have to yeah. uh, need to download the audio. There you go. Yeah. Sure. That would be that would be my thing. Cool. So it's great to hear that you're on on, on uh, we're all on the same page in terms of you're on you know team human voiceover artist for for yeah. audiobooks. But and 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 I feel like the reason that we find it compelling is because humans are messy. Um, nothing's the same twice. Um, there's exactly. little things that are kind of different, and and that when you don't when you've got something that's sterile and is just sort of continuous, it um it, it does something to our brains for some reason. But on the messy front, it must be difficult for you as software engineers, which software is fairly clinical and it needs to you know it needs to have the right sort of syntax and it needs to be in the right order. But like uploading scripts into your system, which is how it works, you upload the script and you upload the audio, and the the, the software will match what you've read with uh, with the the original script. How you know, um, how do you get over the fact that formatting is so different, um, that pe the way people write is so different? Um, there must be a very wide sort of gamut um, to be able to to turn to turn those uh, to, to combine those two things. Uh, definitely. So first off, um, we support e EPUB, Word, and PDF formatted scripts. And for those of you who don't know, PDF uh, is a very flawed file format. It has a ton of formatting issues. And the reason goes back to when PDFs were actually created, they were looking to essentially create a digital letter um, where instead of creating it from scratch, they actually used PDF was a, um, a character language created for, I believe, inkjet printers. And they just kind of square peg round hold it into huh. this PDF format. So that's the reason why. I've so always wondered why. Issues. I've always been like, yeah. why is this so it's, bad? <laughs> it's very imperfect. Um, and I think really... 
there's a bunch of issues with PDF that we kind of have solved um, one by one. One of them is called a ligature when you have, you know, an FF or a TT in a, in a PDF and they're the two characters are touching. Um, an OCR tool, which stands for optical character recognition. It's what we use to import a PDF. It's what if you um, convert a PDF to a Word file, it uses that an, an OCR tool. If you have the F and the F connected, the OCR tool can't combine, can't take that character and turn it into one of the 26 letters of the alphabet because there is no FF character. So sometimes that will cause issues. And if those come up, our developers just kind of solve them one by one. Um, then there's also issues. Basically what our tool is designed to do is compare the exact wording in the audio to the exact wording in the text. So for example, if you have, um, uh, parenthetical references. So you have, you know, the number, say you've got, um, Toby is interviewing me on the podcast. And then, you know, the footnote, uh, number two, if you don't read the number two right there, Positron might say, you didn't say number two in this audio. So we match exactly the script to exactly the audio and that's on purpose. Um, but we have built over time, you know, there's a way that you can use a crop tool to get rid of all the footnotes if you're not going to read them. Um, if you actually upload an, uh, a Word script, it'll automatically, and long as those footnotes are formatted correctly, it'll automatically ignore all those footnotes. Um, so there's a bunch of either technological ways we've done it or user uh, workflows that we've built for certain problems over, you know, six and a bit years now of, of operations. Um, not every, as I say, every script is format built and formatted differently. So it's some of it's been trial and error, um, and then just working with their customers to find the best solution. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, I guess that's what software engineering is all about. It's finding the uh, the exceptions to the rule. Um, exactly. And then building bridges uh, through the software exactly. sort of to do that. Um, so scripts are messy and humans are also messy. Like, um, I'm interested to hear the ways that you um, handle things like accents um, and mm. possibly even um, speech uh, impediments or like the different ways people talk. Um, everyone will have will have tried to take uh, you know um, uh, voice notes and have them turned into text. And especially as a yep. Kiwi, as a New Zealander, we absolutely mangle vowels. Like it's all over the place. And no, and no one, you know, the, the AI is like, what is this guy saying? Even the contextual tools don't quite get it right. So, and they they're generally trained. Uh, these the, the the voice models that recognize speech on North American accents or British accents. Correct. That's the two big ones. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, y how have you gone about training uh, your uh, language engine so that it does account for different accents um, and so, speech impediments? Uh, uh, so part of it is just volume of data certainly helps. I mean, I think we've probably got outside of um, Audible and, you know, the audiobook distributors, probably the largest data set of, of text and audio combination, um, maybe in the world. It's it's very, very large. And so part of, partially our algorithms are so good because we just have so much data to, to continually retrain things. And one thing I just do want to specify Everything we built in Positron is built in house. So we don't take data and transfer it to Apple or transfer it to anyone else. It is kept and always stored in house and never shared with anyone outside of the Positron ecosystem. Um, so in terms of accents, for example, yes, the bulk of our data is North American accents. Um, however, because we've got such a breadth and of the way we built our technology with something called normalization and reverse normalization, um, it enables us to really, really accurately detect what was said in the audio. But full disclosure, um, if you've got an accent, a very heavy accent, um, that especially ones that drop sounds. So for the example I always use, if you have an Irish friend, he or she probably pronounces the number 30 as 30, dropping that H sound. Um, Positron potentially, most likely, will will mark that as a potential mistake. Um, there's a couple of things we've done there. We You can set our proofing algorithm sensitivity, relaxed, normal, or extra sensitive, um, and that will increase or decrease the number of suggestions you get. Um, by 25 to 33% going up to extra, extra sensitive or down to relaxed. So if you've got, you know, an Irish speaker who's going to be having a few more of those false annotations or suggested pickups, um, use the relaxed setting because it still won't miss the really important stuff, but it won't give you as many of those suggestions. So that's number one. Um, number two, we built a, a filter out command, which is basically like ignore all in Microsoft Word. If you're continually getting every sign, every time the number 30 is put into uh, it is said as turty, you can press filter out and that'll ignore that, that potential mistake throughout the rest of the book. Um, 
But the most important uh, thing that we've built is, is our very, very diverse and large um, normalization library. And what normalization means is if you see the number 30 in a book, you probably aren't going to read that as three zero. You're going to read that as 30. If you see Feb 8, 2014, you're not going to read Feb 8, 2014. You're going to read February 8, 2014. Um, Bible verses, times, currencies, there's all of this, this massive library of normalizations where if you see something in a text, it's not that literal reading, it's what a normal human would read. And that's a huge part of, of why our tools are so accurate is over six years, you know, this is all we've been working on day after day. And we've just built up that library of normalizations, which has really helped as well. Mm, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's so, so it's like, we don't even really think about those things um, as English readers and speakers when we come across, like you say, Feb 8. Um, and and I guess it varies slightly between dialects, even like a, like Americans are drop, will, will, will often drop the uh, February the 8th like they would say in Britain and say February 8th. So again, it's like an exception upon an exception, really. So I kind of feel sorry for your your developers. Um, and the other thing that, uh, the other variable, uh, I think there's the script variability, which is huge. The um, the way people talk is also huge, but then the the way they record it, like if they're um, in a different space or, um, you know, uh, people who want to get into audio book, books, possibly the biggest, uh, the biggest hurdle that they experience or or talk to me about at least is meeting the ACX guidelines and having audio that is um, able to be accepted by ACX because of course you know uh, it, there is such a wide um, variety of possible recording environments and sounds and and not, I completely get Audible's attempt to try and um, you know really uh, narrow that down so that you get the, the best quality audio. Um, you've got a tool now. I don't think it fixes the problems, but it, it identifies. It can actually sort of analyze the right. um, the recordings, um, which I find I think like people will find really useful to know what's wrong or where they're not meeting those criteria. So can you talk around that? For sure. And maybe this is actually a good time to just start some of the screen share that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Feel free to um, so to this is our audio analysis tool. And let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, so I'll give a quick demo of how everything in Positron works. Hopefully you can see my screen here. Yep, absolutely. Uh, perfect. Okay. So our audio analysis tool allows you to upload your mastered audio files. In this case, we've got two samples here. You can choose your preset um, in terms of, we have ACX, Audiobooks Unleashed, Authors Republic, and Spotify. We're gonna be building more in there. You can also create your list of test specifications. If you've got, you know, if you're, if you're a voiceover artist and your client has very specific things, you can build your own um, uh, tests. And we allow you to test for um, file format, uh, fi uh, file names being either alphanumeric, or you can actually set a file naming template and make mm. sure that every file is named properly. Uh, audio channel, bit rate, file duration, sample rate, sample peak, true peak, RMS, noise floor, room tone, top and tail duration, file size. And also if you upload everything um, numbered one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It'll actually tell you if you forgot uh, a file. Wow. Um, so then what you're going to do, I'm going to say, I'm going to distribute through ACX. I'm going to click show analysis. Then this will actually test all of those, um, all of those different uh, technical specifications, wow. give you the exact, the actual measurement, um, and then uh, tell you what passed or what failed. And then it will also, in some cases, give you a yellow highlight, which will actually say passed, but really close to the threshold. So you might right. want to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, the next solution for this is going to be, um, we're going to be linking and probably crowdsourcing through all of our users um, a solution. So, hey, okay, your sample peak isn't correct. Click here, it'll go to a YouTube video on how to fix that, specifically for you know beginning um, beginning and early stage um, uh, people in their uh, voiceover or audiobook uh, production process. Mm. Um, and then eventually we'd like to get to the point you can click a button and it'll fix the RMS, you know, click a button, and it'll fix the noise. Flow. We're quite a ways away from that, but that's kind of the end goal. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. That's good. Since we're on screen sharing, do you want to just take us right back to the to the start of Positron Studio and and how oh, people sort of go about ingesting the, the text and the, and the audio and what order things happen in? Because that's another mystery to people that's sort of like, you know, because um, I know there's tools within this that it, 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 this is not a tool to be used just after the fact, after you voiced it. It's something that's to be used in pre-production, production and post-production, correct? Exactly. Yeah. So when you're in Positron, you're going to click create new project, you're going to enter your project title, 
upload your script, which again can be PDF, EPUB, or Word format. Um, you can add some project settings here. You can also control the, as I said, the sensitivity of our proofing algorithm and our noise detection algorithm. Um, then you're going to click this uh, create button, which will go blue as soon as you add a project title. Um, click create. Positron will then process the text and we do a couple things. One, we clean it from a formatting perspective to make sure that what we're going to display to you is clean, is um, free of any formatting issues that come up. Um, two, we will also uh, do a bunch of word analysis that come into our pre our pre production tools uh, for pronunciation and character guide. So uh, this pronunciation tool, for example, click on open suggestions. You choose whichever words on this list you believe your your narrator may not know how to pronounce. So I'll just do uh, Dinah. Of course, this is a good time for my internet to be going slowly. <laughs> Dinah, Charing, uh, Grimpen, Satie, mm. and so Snobbishly. Kind of you, like highlights um, that that you, you want to put in front of your narrator. And we we pull. Um, uh, we pull pronunciation, or, or I should say, suggest pronunciation words um, in a couple of different formats. So we we pull uh, suggest to you capitalized rare terms, so proper nouns that are both capitalized and uncommon throughout the book. Complex words in English, we have a hundred and fifty thousand word database. We've paid narrators to go through line by line and grade every word in terms of complexity. And then we also have a few different lingual or linguistic techniques that we grade word complexity, and then foreign words. And then you can also uh, ca show capitalized common, which will actually show you every single capitalized word in the book, um, hmm. which will generally give you, you know, all the place names and people's names and stuff like that. Mm. But and, then and, once you add and word- to be clear, I was going to say that this can be used by a narrator themselves to highlight words that they are unfamiliar with. Like if they know, then they know. Exactly. Uh, not just exactly. A, a, like an audiobook company. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so we have a number. Some narrators will do this all themselves. Um, mm. Sometimes you'll have a publisher create their project and then share it with the production studio and the narrator and they all collaborate on it together. Mm. So there's a ton of different workflows and we're happy to train anyone on, on a workflow for their specific use case. Mm. But then when you find, when you pull that word in, it'll actually pull the phonetic text and the audio. Sati. Uh, we, hopefully you were able to hear that. Yeah. Sati. Okay, perfect. Um, so then you can also choose different dictionaries. We have Oxford US, Oxford UK, Merriam Webster, and if you choose Forbo, you can actually customize by accent as well. Wow. Um, so yeah. that's based on um, if Forbo is, is kind of the Wikipedia of pronunciations, it's fully crowdsourced. And so if you say, look, I'm, I'm, well, I'm Canadian, for example, so I want the Canadian pronunciation of the word hockey. You can add that word up here and then it will only pull a Forbo recording from a Canadian user. Hockey. Wow. That's amazing. So, uh, so really the idea here is it's going to really speed up your research because not only can you pull a list of words quickly using our algorithm, once you pull those words, you don't have to then go open up a page, type in the word, pull the, pull the correct pronunciation. Um, oh, then yeah. in the example here, we've got the name Jonice, which is a, a character, which is actually the name of the narrator of one of our demo packets here. Um, nothing is found. So there's a few things you can do. You can use any of these clickable links here to search it in Merriam-Webster, Oxford, Forvo, OneLook.com, Youglish, or how you say? In this case, I'm going to click on Youglish. Hopefully, can you see my Youglish page here? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Um, so now Youglish searches um, uh, all of YouTube. I'm going to click Subject play. Subject review, Ray Bearer. It's narrated by John Deese Abbott Pratt, who... I'm 99% sure that's not correct, but for argument's sake, we're going to say it is. I can copy this URL here. I can go in here, type in my phonetic spelling. Copy that URL and then also record Joe Nice, Joe Nice. And then you've got your correct pronunciation. Um, it is a fully collaborative tool, as I said. So you can click share. You can type in uh, the email address of um, your author, for example. You've got a sci-fi book and you don't know how to pronounce some of the character names. They can then log in, come in and collaborate on this tool as well. So it's a very collaborative tool. That way it'll really, really speed up your workflow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Gosh, that's that, that, that uh, is amazing because so like I mean so much of my time yeah when when you get a script even in the sort of commercial and in short form where I work in is in that uh, that research you know if if the uh, if someone has to go and spend the time to usually do these things but this really does yeah. use those automated links that the internet has kind of made possible and the uh, these these huge um, data sets and um, user generated um, information that uh, that is just out there for for use so that's uh, that's such a useful tool exactly it'll also pull if you've got say you've done in your case, Toby, you've done um, well, you've done a whole bunch of voiceover work for Positron. And you, at the beginning, were not sure, is it Positron, is it Positron? Um, you could go in, record a single, in your first project, go record the pronunciation of Positron. Um, well, here, I can give you an example. I'll just add the word Positron here. It will automatically pull. So I've actually previously recorded the pronunciation for Positron. I've got the text and uh, error. Good, good timing on a demo. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it'll actually pull the, that that you've recorded in another project. So you're not mm. going to have to go and redo that. Mm. In an audiobook context, if you've got a whole bunch of books in a series, say you've got your project for book one and you're you've been assigned book two, you can use this transfer research function, which actually move all of your research from book one's project to book two project. Wow. So again, it's that speed mm. up process. You're not having to duplicate work. Mm. Um, we've got a character guide as well that does something very similar. It'll suggest all the character names in the book. Um, in this case, I'm going to find Sherlock here just for an example. And I'm just going to add Sherlock from up here. So you can add your character. You can type in notes about how that character is described, uh, how the character's voice is described in the book, and actually record a sample of you speaking in that character's voice for up to 30 seconds. So again, all of these things that will help automate and speed up your prep for a book. Um, because most, obviously, most narrators and voiceover artists are paid, you know, per, at least in audiobook context, um, per finished hour of audio produced, the more efficient you're going to be, the more you're going to be paid per hour of work. Um, so that's really our goal is to get you as close to that one hour of work to one hour of produced time as possible. Yeah, gosh, that, that's fascinating. Especially, yeah, like um, the other thing with voicing these audiobooks, and people have different techniques for, for getting around this, but is mm -hmm. <clears throat> with characters is staying consistent within that character. So it doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. sort of, you know, start to um, to wobble and uh, and go off yeah. uh, towards the end of it. And then even between book series, like you say, so you can transfer your characters from one book to the next book to the next book. Um, another exactly. Ray Porter series that I've, if you liked um, Project Hail Mary, there's a, a uh, the Bobiverse series. I don't know whether you've gotten heard into. I have, I have not, but yeah, I'm going to take you, a note right now. Yep, absolutely. The Bobiverse series is very much like Hail Mary, but spread over six books and there's about 30 hours of listening. Um, and Ray wow. Porter narrates it beautifully as always. I forget the, yeah. what the first book is called, but make sure you start at the beginning. But that um, he that's a real masterclass in, um, without giving too many spoilers away, like one character kind of um, sort of duplicates and then that duplicates beyond that. And he finds different ways to 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 to, 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 to like differentiate the characters, but it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. So this this would be incredibly useful in that context to just to just record. Um, exactly what each character sounds like and be able to have a reference point to always go back to when you're recording that, which, um, which I For think is sure. brilliant. And mm. we've also, when you, when you say consistency, we've also got this tool here called Scan Occurrences, which currently is only for word pronunciation, but we are building a character version of this, mm. where you can say, for example, I need to pull all mentions of the word positron from every chapter of my book. I'm going to click scan, and this is going to play all 12 mentions of positron back to back to back to back to listen to mm. for consistency. Hmm. Gosh, that's cool. Version two. Positron Studio is... Since Positron is more accurate and sensitive... So it'll play all 12 occurrences. It's got the chapter name as well as the time. If you've got all of them that are mistaken, you can click here and click annotate, and these will actually mark them as a pickup to be fixed. Or you can just say, look, only the first, third, and fifth are incorrect. Hmm. You can mark those as a pickup, or you can actually export a marker file directly into Pro Tools or Audition or Audacity, whatever you're using, and fix it in your DAW. So very, very powerful tool there. And we're also building a version of this tool, which is quite complex, as you can imagine, um, where you're actually going to be able to pull, hey, I want to listen to at all 50 lines of dialogue from Sherlock Holmes in Hound of the Baskervilles. And you're going to be able to listen to that to make sure that's consistent as well. Yeah, so wow. uh, again, cool. something that in the example of a character that's been mispronounced throughout a 5,000, you know, let's say a 10 hour audiobook, 
pulling all of those mentions manually for the 300 occurrences of Sherlock in a book, for example, it's going to take you a lot of time where a couple clicks of a mouse and you've got them all playing back to back to back in Postron. Yeah, yeah. Lots of time saving there, that's for sure. So mm-hmm. I've, I've gone, gone back and like done control F searches in, in, yeah. uh, in, in Microsoft Word, trying to find the instance and then try and find the time yeah. code and then do the pick. And it's, yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah. And I wonder if you've ever gone down the road of, um, of, of people recording directly into this tool. Because it seems like that for things like pickups, like if you just had a list of things to say, it plays you the, the, the reference and then you could just hit record and go straight into it. Is that something that you've investigated or available in this So version? Yes. So currently, so let me just go through. I'm going to show you the proofing really quickly here because I need to actually mark a few things as pickups to then sure. show you how our pickup recording tool works. So what Positron does once you upload your audio files, and I should say... Um, drag and drop your audio here, MP3, Wave, or FLAC format. Positron compares the audio uploaded to the text and then gives you an output of every potential mistake your narrator made, what we call annotations. Um, And I'm just going to show you very briefly, we catch uh, five different types of mistakes. Our audio proofing tool is designed to catch the key mistakes your narrator may make during narration, including words accidentally added into the script by the narrator. So you can see up here, 4222, word inserted accidentally. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mark that as a pickup. Words missed from the script of... So he omits that should be narrated, words missing that should be narrated. Mark that as a pickup. Of course, it will find misperceptions and misspoken words. So he says misperceptions instead of mispronunciations. Mark that as a pickup. Pauses longer than two seconds. Noises. So we've t- detected a 2.4 second pause. I'm going to mark that as a long pause. And then finally, including audio distortions, synthetic sound issues, and natural noises like a dog barking or a fire truck siren. So we're going to catch all of these things. Basically, what your user needs to decide is on each of these annotation cards on the left. Is this okay? Either it's a false positive that sometimes happens in Positron by nature of us being erring on the side of being too cautious, um, or it's an actual mistake that doesn't need to be fixed. You know, it's a tiny little thing. It really doesn't affect the meaning. Um, And then you're going to click OK or pick up on each of those. Now we have recently built, and this is our first step towards being able to record a full book inside of Positron. Eventually, we'd like to get to the point where Positron will actually proof live as you're reading and give you that automatic, it's like having a directed session, um, but the AI is basically telling you what mistakes you're making live as you're reading. Mm. Um, But right now, our pickup recording tool will automatically pull the um, pickups that you've marked in your book. So here, for example, I can listen to the original recording. Including words accidentally added into the script by the narrator. Now I'm going to click start recording. Words added into the script by the narrator. It'll process. Words added into the script by the narrator. And you can see why no one pays me to record anything commercially. Um, uh, but then you can compare the two. And then if you're working for a customer, you could actually have this sent to them and they would be able to approve that pickup or request changes. Once that it's approved, if I go in and record all of these um, all of these pickups, the, you can then download all of those recorded pickups in one, in either as a single file or as a separate file, and also pair that with DAW markers where you will actually be able to import that file into your Pro Tools session, and it'll mark where every single pickup needs to get edited um, in a with a label. Um, so that, and we support, uh, I think, twelve or thirteen different DAWs, Pro Tools, Audition, Audacity, Studio One, Twisted Wave, Reaper, um, and a whole bunch of other ones. So, um, a very flexible, time-saving tool from that perspective. But as I said, the goal eventually. People can record in Positron. They can proof it live as they're doing their recording if they like. Um, and really everything that they that currently involves delays in the steps between recording and proofing and pickups. Um, if you can remove any of those delays through best in class software tools, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, gosh, that's fantastic. So, I mean, thank you for taking us through the uh, the Positron tool. It's it's amazing how many um, you know facets of of you know any kind of friction point that uh, the audio book narrators have sort of come across. You've um, you've realized and then found a, a software solution, uh, which I think is fantastic. How how have you sort of gone about that? Has it been purely industry driven? 
Um, so I would argue that in my three years running the company, no one in the world has talked to more diverse group of audiobook narrators, uh, really editors, people who run production companies and publishing houses. Um, so a lot of our tools have come from um, a user suggestion. So that scan occurrences tool, for example, that exact example you said, I mispronounced a character name 200 times in a book and I had to go control F on every one of them. Um, we got that idea and we built a tool. So um, with very few exceptions, actually, um, a lot of our tools have come out of user feedback, user suggestions, um, or generally if we build something brand new, um, we will uh, roll it out in beta. We'll then go through a bunch of user feedback loops where people tell us what they love and ideally what they hate about the tool uh, so we can fix it. I'm a big believer in the power of hopefully constructively negative feedback because it just allows us to get better. Um, it's one thing if we're just guessing, sure, yeah, people must love this. Uh, much better if people tell us what they actually think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so really, we we have a lot of different avenues for people to give us their honest feedback about the tool because it mm -hmm. just allows us to get better. And if you, Toby, are having an issue with the tool, I can guarantee you there's 15 other users who are having that same issue and are not voicing their concerns about it. So Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the last thing, you know, once people are sold on this like um i was on on my demo not that i really i mean in my my personal situation is that i do a lot of short form audio so it doesn't mm -hmm. it's it you know it's there's no there's not as much economic incentive uh, for me to go for this as there is um, for someone who does long form uh, e-learning or medical narration or audiobooks is the obvious example um yep. in terms of charging for this um i like the fact that you have um made it kind of a per project um or like a well actually do you want to do you want to describe how it is charged because i think it's quite of sensitive to, to to audiobook narrators yeah so we have two different um our script prep tools which are that pronunciation guide the character guide um scan occurrences which allows you to, to listen to um, pronunciation consistency um and one thing i didn't show is the ability to actually once you've done your prep export your pdf back to you with all your pronunciation words highlighted and your character words highlighted and and notes automatically added into your pdf those are all just a flat per project fee um uh between eight and ten dollars per project so um pretty simple one-time pricing there um, but our proofing side of things is all based on how much audio you upload and everything is charged down to the minute uh, so our flat rate pays you go no subscription cost is $12 per hour of audio but again you upload one minute you're charged for a minute you're not um, you know rounded up to the nearest hour um, and all of our subscriptions and all of our payment plans are always month to month so if you've got one month where you've got a crazy amount of work um, you can go up to one of our higher volume plans and save a bunch per hour um, and then the next month is December and you're you know going to Thailand for a month for or something like that and not going to be working you just cancel your plan or put it on pause um, so everything is month to month and very, very flexible. So, you know, in the case of someone who's doing short two or three minute chunks of commercial VO for YouTube videos, for example, you upload three minutes of audio and proof it, you're only charged for three minutes. Mm, yeah. And, and I feel like it, that it, this new method of pricing, which pretty much everyone has, has swapped to, um, uh, the other big one that comes to mind is like Source Connect or those collaboration tools where back in the day, you know, mm -hmm. if this was developed back in, the, I don't know, 2005, you would pay like $900 flat fee, <laughs> and then yeah, um, and exactly. which no one could afford apart from the top audio mm -hmm. narrators. But now yeah. I really like the idea that you can, um, you can quote your fee to record an audiobook as like, you know, I'll do this for 250 US dollars per finished hour plus positron fees. And like, mm -hmm. if you make Make it the system you use you can just kind of add that on and since people are familiar with the tool they can kind of just go oh like you know it's that that seems like a reasonable fee and there's this for convenience which um which i, I kind of like that that you can do it's, that which is great exactly and really i've had some people say well now it's you know an additional cost in my production workflow um you know how how do i justify that and for me if you can't find say you're on our our plan where you're getting four dollars a month you're paying less than $10 per, or sorry, four hours per month. I think I said $4 per month. You're paying less than $10 per hour. If you can't find $10 of efficiency out of an hour of audio production uh, using Positron, I'll give you your money back because I'd be very, very surprised. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you believe in the ethos of time is money, you're going to save uh, a significant amount of time on every hour of audio content you create using our tool. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's that kind of dead time. It's the time no one wants to spend doing that stuff too, like control Fing to find all those um, those exactly. those next uh, iterations. Like that's one of the most frustrating jobs I have uh, when it comes to editing and, and proofing and pickups is is finding yeah. that sound, like you say. So no, that's fantastic. So just with, we're kind of approaching the um, the hour, but I wanted to kind of finish again going back to the, the broader topic because you're pretty well placed as someone who has, has Sue, who works at the cutting edge of machine learning, has talked to a lot mm-hmm. of audiobook narrators and publishers around the world um, and bring the conversation back to what is the future of um, audiobook narration um, I recently mm-hmm. um, you know appeared at a symposium where I said you know I think the future is quite bright because AI is showing what value there is in the human voice um, what mm-hmm. are you sort of hearing on the ground from publishers and long-form audio uh, producers in the marketplace of, of what the future is so I think at the bottom line the market continues to grow um, because there is across all types of entertainment content, essentially an insatiable desire for any sort of entertainment content, whether that's, you know, shows to put on YouTube and Amazon Prime or or audiobook content or any sort of scripted audio. So that's good news for everyone that the market continues to grow and and the thirst for things for people to listen to continues to grow. Um, These AI synthetic narration companies are going to take a part of the market. you know, there's there's going to be types of voiceover and audiobook content that lend themselves more to to that synthetic audio. I mean, everyone's listened to it. It's the prosody of the of the synthetic speech that just doesn't it just doesn't sound right, especially in long form. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, how much this synthetic AI narration um, is going to change things and take business from from uh, narrators depends really on three things. One, the distributors really are the gatekeepers. So how much they're going to allow um, synthetic audio onto their platforms, number one. Um, number two, how much rights holders will actually agree and choose to go the AI route, um, you know, uh, currently... Currently, those AI companies are or the synthetic companies are nowhere near as efficient as they claim to be. In in my estimation, in terms of there still is a lot of human intervention required. It's not like mm. you just put in a script and press play and a perfect audiobook comes out. That's not how it works. Mm. Um, but really, the bottom line is the amount of disruption the synthetic audio narration um, is is going to create. It's going to depend entirely on listeners and how much they will actually pay for synthetic narrated audio content. So if you, mm. in theory, if you if you look back into like the Kindle revolution where everyone said, this is great, my books are gonna be so much cheaper because I don't have to pay for paper. No, it's exactly the same cost to buy it on Kindle as it is to buy an actual book. Mm. Um, synthetic audio is, audiobooks are not gonna cost less than human narration. So it's gonna be up to the listeners to depend, you know, would I spend $9.99 to listen to Ray Porter or would I spend $9.99 to listen to Robot Joe? Um, and that's going to be the real decision point. Um, mm-hmm. Bottom line, the market is growing. I too believe that the um, the outlook is bright for human narration, just because of um, the you know I think the audiobook con- audiobook industry, at least in the U.S., according to the Audio Publishers Association, has grown double digit percentages for like twenty straight years. Mm-hmm. Um, name another industry that's grown like that for twenty straight years. It's 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 a small list. So. Um, I think the future is bright despite all of the existential worry about these AI companies. So. Yeah, yeah. And is there word whether Audible, who's, who is the biggest provider and has sort of the biggest catalogue, um, do they even, like when someone has a new project and they want to put it on the marketplace, is there a, like a checkbox? Is there a metadata that, that says this is synthetic, this is human, and that's like, you know, do, do or, or is it up to the person listening to go, I think that's like a, a, an AI so- voice? I can't say categorically. I know that Audible does check. um, uh, My understanding is, I should say, uh, that Audible does check for a number of different things, whether it's those technical specs that our audio analysis tool checks for, um, or if it's AI narration. I know there have been some very public examples of things sneaking through. I would imagine Audible and ACX has such a volume of incoming content, there's no possible way that they could check everything. Um, but last I checked, uh, it was still not allowed to to distribute um, synthetic voice by Audible. Mm-hmm. However, stuff does sneak through. Um, mm-hmm. I know, I believe it's Find Away Voices is now just allowing some synthetic audio um, production. So it'll, it's going to be allowed in some way, shape or form. But again, it's going to come to the end of, you know, does a, does the, um, 
does the synthetic version of a book actually sell and make it, you know, even if you don't have to pay a human narrator, you still have to pay the company that's doing the synthetic narration. So there is still a cost to it. And if that cost benefit analysis from a business perspective doesn't make sense, then people are going to keep using audio, uh, mm -hmm. human audio uh, narrators. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I see mm -hmm. it going. Yeah, absolutely. And and partially because people when you, you latch onto a good narrator like uh, like I say like Simon Vance or uh, or Ray Porter like you you end up reading or you end up um, buying books that they narrate because like oh, because of the author because yeah, of the narrator exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you you kind of it's it's like your friend telling you a story like it, there is that personal connection which I I don't think um you get with those uh, synthetic voices as well. So yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So um finally um Nearly finally, I have two more questions. Uh, one is that, you know, looking forward to the future of Positron, what's the, the biggest problem you're wanting to solve at the moment? What's the next big sort of generative leap that you hope to have um, through Positron? What are you looking forward to in the development future? Um, one of the the nearest term uh, early, early 2024 20, projects we're going to be um, running is the ability to pull more acting cues out of a book. So we're building a dialogue detector where you can actually say, okay, for Sherlock in Hammer of the Baskervilles, I want to see every line of dialogue from Sherlock or from Watson. Um, I want to see every physical description of that character from the book. Um, so that's one thing we're, we're, we're pulling and that's going to be able to allow people to prep how they voice a character mm -hmm. so much faster and so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, possibly because that, it is that, that, that workflow that some actors have, which is they voice all the character lines first and then they do all the narrator, mm -hmm. narrator lines separately and it'll get stitched together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things we're working on. Really the biggest leap we're looking to make is that live proofing that I mentioned earlier, where you're able to record an entire audiobook. We are building a teleprompter as a first step where you're able to do all your prep. Um, so you, you know, if you're doing a full read through, you're actually, instead of reading the actual book, you're reading through it in Positron. You're able to double click on a character and add that to your character list. You're able to double click on a word you don't know and add that to your pronunciation list. But then once all your prep is done, you're going to integrate that into the teleprompter, read off the teleprompter, and then eventually Positron will give you that live feedback. Oh, hey, Toby, you said this word incorrectly. Um, mm -hmm. So you could basically do a punch and roll session live with Positron's feedback. That's yeah. the, uh, that's the end goal. That's powerful, isn't it? That would be mm -hmm. that would be the ultimate tool. I mean, basically, like having a director sitting opposite you, um, reading through exactly. you know, which, that, which uh, yeah, 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 fantastic. Oh, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, um, you're in um, Vancouver, Canada, I think, aren't you? Yes. You're, um, what's it like that this time of year? Uh, it's currently, uh, well, from a Celsius perspective, about 10 degrees in gray. Uh, we had an atmospheric river yesterday, uh, oh, wow. which I think it was. I think it rained. It basically rained for 24 hours straight and had a torrential, torrential downpour. And wow. um, luckily, it's all all the water's gone away now. But generally, you're looking at gray skies and rain between now and April. Oh, um, <laughs> the occasional snow. We're kind of fake Canadians. We get uh, we get we can drive two hours to one of the world's greatest uh, ski hills in Whistler, but we generally don't have to shovel our walks very often. So, wow, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's six fantastic. six to ten degrees and rainy for the next four months for us. Oh dear. Well, a good time to uh, curl up in front of the fire with an audio book. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for making uh, some uh, time for us today. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that you wanted to uh, to say while we're on the call? No, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, for anyone who is curious about Positron, either about our technology, about you know, uh, the general uh, AI machine learning impact on the, you know, kind of at the macro level um, on the industry, uh, please reach out to us. I can be reached personally at adam, A-D-A-M, at positron.com, P-O-Z-O-T-R-O-N.com, Z if you're Canadian, Z if you're American. Um, and, uh, or just go to our website. You can book a demo with our team. We're happy to jump on a call and show you everything our tool can do for your workflow. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks for your time today, Adam. Likewise. Thank you, Toby.